Uh, first of all, welcome. Um, this is our closing closing event, Arts and U and H uh, with alumni reading. Um, and so, what we decided to do is um, ask some of former students, some faculty, uh, to come read. And so, it's always you know interesting to have these to sort of see what people are doing. Uh, I, I like this part of it, but also to highlight um, you know people that came from this program. So that's the most important thing. And so, starting things off, we're going to um, bring up Angela Sathar, who actually uh, was a search student of mine this past summer. Um, and we, she, she did a project on um, gender and spectrum theory, and part of her um, project was a chapbook. Which is, you know, very proud of what she did, very good chapbook. And so, we want to start off with Sai, um, who was a student of the University of New Haven. Uh, majoring in forensic science. <coughs> she was recently published in the Mark Twain Annual. Angela is currently the president of the Skeptics and Secular Society and VP of Sigma Tau Delta. Come on. Come on. Now I'm the president. goes over three cultures throughout the world. Um, it focuses on two spirits of the Native Americans, the Hijara from India, and the Bishu, Kalai, and Kalabai of South Sulawesi, Indonesia. So I'm just going to read maybe one or two from each section. But first, this is the preface, called Pronouns. He, his, him. He has, he is, he will. His thoughts, his person, it was him, a man, an identification. She, hers, hers. She has, she is, she will. Her thoughts, her person, it was hers, a woman, an identification. She, here. She has, she is, she will. Her thoughts, her persona, it was hers. An individual's, an identification. This next one is the first poem from the Two-Spirit section. It's called, His Name Was Alexis. Moved off the res years ago at the re realization of who he was. The name given at birth never fit the image of himself. Tall enough to collect stars, strong enough to conquer mountains, independent enough to be true. It was a restraint, a thousand pound weight on a child's shoulders constraining him to roles of gender he wasn't meant to be part of. In a world dominated by binary, he fell in between the cracks. Long hair, dresses, ceremonies outlining a person confined to one category. One sex that defines an entire being. A word became restrained, then fixed into iron bars imprisoning him in an ill-filleted body. Bars enclosed him, he struggled, desperate to escape a feminine prison. Every struggle ignored, every act of defiance renounced. Whoever Alexis was meant to be would not be found in the confines of her. This next one is the first from the Hijara section. It's called Kolam. Each morning before the sun rose high enough to peer through the windows, Fahim awoke with his sisters to begin the daily chores. His cleaning and cooking abilities were weaker, but the pride felt in each accomplishment was immense. Days where he awoke early enough to clean the walkway in front of the house, scrubbing it with water and cow feces in preparation for the kalam were the most treasured. Occasionally, his sisters would even let him help with simple five-point kalams. The stone powder left his hands coated in splotches of colors, always found later by his brother or father. Although they scolded, threatened, and beat him, Fahim continued to join his sisters, especially on Fridays, when Kalams were designed for the goddess Lakshmi. Kalam for the goddess were his favorite. 
Designs were intricate, requiring patience and precision. Two things Fahim had not mastered. Whenever he tried helping the goddess with the goddess Kalam, his sisters would complain, leaving his brother Jashis to drag him inside. There he had his window perch, where he watched the Kalam's creation, every elegant flick of feminine wrists captivated his attention until the design was complete. This happened every week until his father called him. After that, he was forced to stay away from the windows, Kalam's, his sister's chores, unless he wanted Jashes to beat him. Instead, he slipped into his sister's room, taking the first sari he could find and get his hands on. Back in his bedroom, he would shyly dress before a mirror, imagining a girl his age looking back through the polished glass. One morning, his father caught his weekly routine. Fahim's cries as the stick struck his back pierced the otherwise silent house. Jashus wouldn't speak to him for hours once he was finished. And this one is the first from the Vishu chapter, a section. It's called Malatau. A barren middle world drew Potokwe's three servants from their duties for days. Upon their return to the upper word, world, Patokoi demanded of them, where have you been that you would avoid me? To the middle world, they replied, where it is startlingly barren, there is no life upon the land to bring, no beings to which to look upon a god and call him Lord. No one could praise the underworld, Lord. Could you not have one of your children descend and inhabit the earth? For you cannot be a god without Mans Manusha, under the upper world or above the underworld. The world will be empty of worship, and no gods will be called Lord. It is said that Patokwes thought this over and decided to send his son, Bataraguru, to the middle world to descend as the first of humankind, the Malutau. From his descendants came the white-blooded Bugis royalty. Sitting in their courts, ambassadors between humankind and gods, the Bishu. Through these individuals and their connection to the Dewata, marriage rites and rituals were upheld. Vishu were more than the Tao around them. They embodied what it meant to be both male and female, man and woman, allowing them to possess, be possessed by the Dewata during their contacting rituals. I don't know if I have any more time. So that's three. One more. One more. Okay, which section? Always one more. Pick a section. Somebody pick a section. <laughs> no. Um, did you read from all three? One ones? of each, yeah. I like the Indian section. Yeah. Okay. I have that marked off. It's um, actually a really good book, so, you know, I mean, if y'all feel I'm, so inclined. I have them here if anyone wants to. We got to copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a CD. <laughs> okay, so the second poem from the two-spirit section is called History of Another. Written by biased white men and few white women, books tell, 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 tell legends af left after. History twisted by sodomites, sinners of lust lay mutually, a continent misunderstanding that a new world was only new to them. The savage acts were simply incomprehensible. Someone outside their social code could ruin everything. There would be no right to the conquerors, to the savages' treasures, fabled gold, lands, bodies, if denied by their logic, indigenous persons were socially similar. Not savage. Any account to prove otherwise was valuable. To prove the invaders' right, divine by their god's will as opposed to any other's encounter. Righteousness became tribal enslavement due to the Badachi, the kept boys. Originally a Persian word, later transported to Europe and settling on French tongues, it defined a prostitute, a slave forced to sleep with others, same laid slant, same. Labeling cracks between male and female, man and woman, within an invaded continent newly named America. <laughs> All right. Um, like to on the All right. Now this is the good part because I don't necessarily need like 
bios or anything like that. I know people. Um, you don't know me? <laughs> I didn't need yours either. I just, you know. Okay. Anyway. Um, thank you, Angela. Uh, next reader is going to be uh, Kara Petit. And um, Kara is a former graduate. She's a graduate of the University of Hayden. English. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, she's currently adjuncting here uh, with us um, at the University of Navy, the English Department as well. She has an MFA from Western Con Connecticut State, right? West Con, if I'm not mistaken. In fiction? All right. So, with that said, come on up here and read some fiction. <laughs> Give her a round of applause. This is something that doesn't really have a title. Um, it's something I'm currently working on. I actually wrote it for a flash fiction contest that I didn't really get too far in, but um, so we'll see how it goes. When I died, I expected to be free of the 40 hour work week and the white cube desk job, but the attorneys on the bridge to purgatory only promised more of the same. I was assigned another desk job where I would write contracts and legal documents, and then I was told to sign a contract that ensured a fair opportunity to move on to a better place once I put my time in. It was better than what my day job had offered, so I tore the contract from the attorney's hand and scribbled in my name. In a day, I was at the palace of home of the prime minister, who was one of the Kinwu, Purgatory's stone girl and ruling class. In a week, I had written over 100 legal documents for his greatness. In a year, my hands were raw and petrified from completing over 7,000. It was then that the Kinwu had determined that my time was up. I was sent from the writing room to a dungeon barbershop where a demonic looking being with gray skin and green eyes prepped me for freedom. How does this all work, I asked. He sneered as he cleaned his cutting shears. You're to run for your life, of course. Didn't you read the contract? His chuckle annoyed me, and his inhuman face made my stomach turn. No, I replied. I don't have time for such things. What's the race about? He eyed the other barbers and leaned in. All souls lose unless they win. There's no in-between. I toiled over his words while he shaved close to the scalp. I was surprised that, without my insight and mop, I possessed the same strange reddish-gold coloring that I was accustomed to in my human life. Soon after, I was given a tunic, shorts, and a pair of worn-out shoes to run in before being ushered into a dark hallway with hundreds of other enslaved souls. They all held a bit of their earthly hues, painting the underground hallway like bulbs on a Christmas tree. The thought of Christmas tickled my gut as the sizzling whistle of the intercom buzz wrenched two dozen heads toward the nearest speaker. My fellow souls whispered excitedly until a raspy voice, so grungy and bleak, filled the void in our attention. Gates are opening, it said. I tried to ask the souls on either side of me what the rules were, but they only smiled at me in a manner that frightened me. Brick walls on my left and right trembled while the iron bars at the front swung ajar. When the edge bar banged against the brick, the hallway erupted and every soul began thrashing against his neighbor. Startled by the sudden movement, I jumped forward as a gap in the crowd appeared near the left wall. Before my compatriots could weasel through, I slipped my feet between a pair of wrestling pagans and ducked out into a wider, longer hallway. Behind me, souls began to shred each other apart, many unable to reach the gates before another tore into their flesh. I broke into a sprint. The mansion of Akalon, the home of Purgatory's prime minister and his army of shackled servants, transformed around me. I passed through gilded arches decorated with ornamental veils, down waxed passages, and past enormous rooms where I had eaten supper on my arrival at Limbo. All of them, now empty, had been cleared for a new class of tormented souls, our replacements. The makeshift raceway dug into the, scenery of, dug into the scenery of the minister's compound, transformed as I made it out of the mansion and into the gardens. Shackled to two other souls at all times, I had never had the pleasure of wandering among the hedges. My companions found the monstrous flowers and strangely colored grasses unsettling and had preferred to, make, to remain indoors. A voice in the back of my mind begged me to pause and enjoy what made my last glimpse of natural life, but the sound of distant thudding on the dirt ripped me from my fantasy. I closed my eyes just long enough to focus on the footsteps as I rounded another corner and broke into a desperate gallop. The soul was growing closer, but his footsteps were growing lighter. A gust of wind confirmed my suspicions. I turned to see my old cuffmate Julian, a pink winged fallen from Albuquerque, pursuing me like a hawk pursues a field mouse. 
Clipped wings had not slowed him down, nor had they prevented him from cheating. I saw the gains in his step with every faint flap. He would be at my heels before long. The race will set you free, a voice whispered. I passed through a garden arch and dropped down to a slippery stairwell where railings had already crumbled, and crumbled into dust before I attempted to grab onto them. Julian used the wings to his advantage, soaring down behind me and overtaking me in one swoop. I ducked at the last moment and let him fly past, dodging his sharp talon nails as he attempted to dig them into my skull. We stumbled into a hall with thousands of picture frames lining the ten-story walls. Each depicted a soul and its fate, where that soul spent eternity was spelled out in light or in blood. As we approached the next room, the pictures became noticeably blank. These hung empty, waiting to be filled, like mine. The finish line appeared in the trophy room. Julian passed through the doorway with me at his tail, then swerved as he lost footing on the marble floor. I thought of the frames again, the blank spaces in the fates, remembering all too well the words of the barber, that all souls lose unless they win. My moral compass lost in the pink swirls of Julian's wings, I dug into the side of my torso, desperate for a weapon with which I could put down a weak but frightening fallen angel. With a violent tug, I pulled free a fragment of rib and speared it through Julian's back. He faltered and then fell. I jumped over his body. I sprinted. I reached the end. Unlike the runners who made it into the hall later than me and Julian, I didn't observe my frame filled with the blood of hellfire of my cemented fate. I looked into the glassy eyes of the Kin Wu Prime Minister, who sat on a pedestal beyond the finish line and waited to be expelled to heaven, but they only went on about an exclusion clause. I let out a screech as the contract I had signed was rolled across the dais and down the marble steps where I waited on my hands and knees. The elder Kin Wu proclaimed that I had won the race, but it wasn't until his stern expression turned to laughter that I realized what I had done to my companion and to myself. A pit opened up beneath my body, and the attorney who had held my contract climbed from its depths, reaching outward toward me and grabbing me by the arm before pulling me in. Right. Care another round of applause. Thank you. Um, next up to the mic. I feel like I'm in open mic or something. Next up to the mic. <laughs> is uh, Chris Grillo. Um, Chris is probably the elder statesman here in terms of, I think. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, I met Chris years ago. He was in my class, uh, Intro to Creative Writing. And he took about two or three classes with me, did service learning. Ended up going to uh, Southern Connecticut, getting an MFA, um, published a chat book, um, and now he has his first full length collection coming out. So definitely uh, proud of Chris and you know what he's done. Um, he's currently teaching at um, with Amistad. Yep. Yeah, Amistad. Um, so Chris called up to read a few poems and let's give Chris a warm round of applause. <laughs> warm welcome. So it's, there's, I published the first, the two chaps um, before I put the full line together. It's, it's my uh, MFA thesis, and these poems are, I feel like, are so old at this point. You know, they've been living for four or five years in the making, and it's finally done, so that's always a really nice thing. Um, I don't think they're, I look, look through them now, and I'm like, oh, you know, it's like, there's so much that I would do differently. I think that's how. All right, it's real. But anyway, um, you don't grow unless you feel that way. That's right. So uh, it's very much like a coming of age. -y. There's um, a main, a main character, a speaker, and it's, I guess, different than a lot of questions in the sense that it's super linear, or it tries to be anyway. Um, so there's the speaker, and then his relationship with his good friend, his friend Frankie, and then there's his romantic relationship, and the two kind of. Um, it just focuses on those two relationships kind of back and forth, and I hope it melds together nicely. So um, the first, what am I reading? So Frankie and the speaker uh, are high school football players in the very beginning, and they're, they're just gonna, uh, they're being punished for gear left out from their coach, and so it's called St. Christopher. Um, 
who is the patient saying of carrying things? For an oversimplified explanation. Uh, the slow, stubborn walk of a dumb punk kid. Frankie's weight bearing down in full gear slung across my shoulders like a fireman as I walk the length of the field, the punishment for gear left out the night before. He plays with the ends of my chin guard straps the way a child pulls at the hem of its mother's dress, singing fight songs in the ear hole of my helmet over coach's ball from the, from the goal line, something about captains carrying their teams. We're supposed to switch at the 50-yard line, but I'm bigger than Frank. He needs his legs for Friday's game, so I trudge. I press on. I tell Frank to fuck off through breath exhausted from laughter. When we finish, coach lectures, but I hear nothing over the drone in my helmet as my head swells and retracts. He's looking at me, but he's talking to Frankie, with his horse saddle skin grooved deep around his eyes, his near seven feet crooked from years of ball, bent and twisted under pads and iron. So the first section is very much um, kind of an adolescent section. They're very young, and there's, it, I mean, he's trying to work to establish this idea of like, that Frankie's gonna fall from grace at some point and get himself into some trouble. Um, and at the same time, there's a falling from grace, or like a falling out between the speaker and his romantic interest. And this is probably the first poem that reveals that. It's called The Fade Out. With an ear flush to Charlene's chest, I hear our blood slow along the baseline, the single note that starts each measure and rattles loose change in this truck cab. The piano ascends each chord, note by note, reaching the crest of the arpeggio before falling gracelessly. I press hard beneath her bra. Her nipple slips to the web of my fingers while the other hand fumbles for the clasp. The snare drum is frightening gunfire in perfect quarter notes, and Otis sings, you are tired and you want to be free. Charlene brushes my eyes closed, and for a moment I am fooled, wonderfully aimless, the scent of her skin overwhelming, but in the dark I realize I could be anyone, just a, ne a neck for her to cling to, an ear for her to bite, and all I hear above our shortened breath, you are tired and your love has grown cold. Otis read the song. So this is the title poem of the second chap, and it's called The Sixfold Radial Symmetry of Snow. Um, it's about Frank and the speaker driving a little, a little drunk through the snow. And I was a Google search and tried to figure out names of titles of poems one day, and something came up about how snowflakes have sixfold radial symmetry. So I don't really know what it means or its significance to the poem, but it sounds cool. <laughs> Frank and I are half drunk and laughing. <laughs> trying to keep count of snowflakes driving into the storm. We talk about the years, how they used to drag on, like phone poles or exit signs on the roadside. You can see them come and go the whole way, until time starts to come up on you quicker, like fence rails that blur together the faster you drive, and more years have passed than you can count. But I still think we should try and follow just one flake from as far off as we can, until the moment it hits the windshield, explodes like rocket glare and floodlights, sits his water for one more second, pleading, till the wiper comes down like a scythe and sweeps it away. This is um, later, I guess, towards the middle of the collection. And uh, it's kind of the speaker's like lament over losing his love interest. Uh, she goes away to college, that's um, kind of laid out and he kind of stays home and um, bangs around town with Frankie and gets himself in trouble. But this is called uh, Dreaming of Charlene. Charlene is bone white and nearly glowing while twilight mutes the world around her. Amidst the boardwalk smells, the sand we wear on our bare feet, and the white caps that break and strain to lick them clean, there is only her, a little piece of moon liberated from a place behind thunderheads, fallen from the sky, bathed in the stagnant waters of Long Island Sound and washed up on the shore. I desire her fair skin, that imperfect canvas, so I blanket her in color and mark her mind, with a deep blue iris at the center of each palm and in the arches of her feet like stigmata. Born from each wound, dead fire thorn grows, follow as I finger wrist to breast by her arm and heel to thigh by the inseam of each leg. 
I dot sour berries, dirty yellow like an old raincoat, and stop at the lipstick bullseye that centers her face around her smile. Charlene moans and drones like a canter, whispers words from memory like enchantments. They weigh heavy on my heart, but mean nothing to her. I am just blood and skin for her spell. When I have finished and Charlene is tattooed, she rises and rinses again in the water, and once more she is luminous. Each time I meet her, she is luminous, and that way she remains, never letting anything eclipse her from where she has cast her light for too long. <clears throat> um, so the collection is called Hero's Tunnel. Uh, and Hero's Tunnel is the name of the tunnel, uh, the Merritt Parkway, if you're going is that going to south, Hartford? Going, yeah, no, going south, going like, through Woodbridge. The exit before Woodbridge. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's called the Heroes Tunnel. Or it's called Heroes Tunnel. Um, and the poem before this is called Heroes Tunnel. But I'm not going to read that poem for the sake of time. Um, and this is after that. Um, and they're Frankie and the Speaker are running, running away. They've they've just committed like a low level crime, and now they're you know they're running away to Florida, um, or actually they're running away to. They're gonna stop in South Carolina and see Charlene first, but um, it's called The Getaway. By dusk, we were somewhere outside Philly. Frankie swallowed the first of the uppers and I lost count of junction signs trying to pinpoint colors in Twilight's arbitrary scheme. I thought the day's bristles surely bore warmth and night dipped its brush in cools like rain over slate. But what if they went to one another? And it was darkness projecting June kiss nudes and amber grains when the light grew tired and dull, to eggplant, violet, and sonata navy. <clears throat> By Arlington, it was past midnight, and there was no burning neon or skyscraper needles lit like upturned cigarettes that we could mistake for stars. The moon moved with us, dodging our glances behind thunderheads, the way our stares spun away on necks when schoolgirls felt the heat of our eyes. I thought of Frankie's house when we were kids, and the tennis ball tips of Miss O'Brien's walker like little stars themselves catching tree roots along the lattice fence as she spied through the yards, and the time she told our mothers when we lit bottle rockets to see who'd hold the longest and ran a blow-up pool of ground in the stream behind her house. Would the moon rat us out now, the pills, the shit talk, the copper we stole up north, and would we answer to the day to speed traps set up outside, set up for out-of-state plates? Could penance sting the way daddy's belt did? There is no God, Frankie said and we were quiet as color climbed reluctantly back up over the dash. But the gray that came before, I knew was ours. This is the third section, and it's the one that I've written, uh, I guess, most recently. It's probably the only part of this that's, that, was, that I wrote when we moved from my MFA. Um, and it was, I just think it was like the nice 30 or 20 or so poems to round off the story. and. Um, I had a, um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> Frankie gets himself in trouble, whatever. He ends up getting himself in a lot of trouble, gets some addiction problems, and uh, goes off to rehab in California. And there's a lot of poems around about California and things like that. And it's the first time you hear from another speaker as well. So this is called Homesick. Um, and a buddy of mine, actually, who is an addict, went out to California and has homesick tattooed across his fingers. That's where this came from. <clears throat> Homesickness is for college girls. Their tongues slurring all the wrong words, their lips wrapped around all the wrong things. Dining hall pasta and bagels three times a day that rear their ugly head on obtuse angled thighs. But college girls go home the summer after freshman year, hop on treadmills and fad diets, shimmy back into graduation gowns indefinitely. I am fucking terminal. Little bits of home like tumors that swell in my gut. From a town back east where young boys open helicopters that fall off maple trees, stick them to their nose and play alien. That place pulls at me, worse now than the junk, sets up 20 foot swells off San Clemente, the beach town where I've been sober for nine months. Sorry for all the college girls. It's not me, it's Frankie. Um, this is called Charlotte Goes to Therapy. I think I got like two minutes or so. Um, and it's like this idea of someone that you feel like you know and then you one day you don't know them for whatever reason. You fall out or you lose touch 
um, that's just that interesting dynamic of like really not feeling really alienated from someone who you were once very close with. Charlene goes to therapy once a week for an hour, or at least she used to when I knew her. I say new not because I can no longer pick her from a lineup. She is tall, white, at least some of its ground cover ivy, a bit above the rest, and what's worse, she knows it. No, I say new because now, in an empty hall, if she and I were to pass, her smile would be sterile, and I'd cover with goosebumps that raise under stethoscope metal. It'd be a far cry from the naked gaze that bathed me under her rustled afghan. I dodged piles of our discarded clothes from the wine rack in the hall to the warmth of her bed, and like a courier through a minefield, running not for his life, but simply to be heated. Oops. I ran to again touch the five our breaths made just from talking. Now I'll read this last one. This is a little different. It's actually not in the book. This is a misprint um, copy. That's why I have it. <laughs> the art. Yeah, this is. Um, it's called The Effect of Space Flight on the Human Body. The science teacher on my team, my TJ, is great um, writing. But the science teacher on my team and me have a lot of discussions about uh, the universe. And it's really poetic, like inherently poetic. Um, so the effect of space flight on the human body. We do not orbit, but free flow, letting go of what binds us to ourselves. We touch worlds where language fails and form loses permanence where we hike or eat Thai food despite our former assertions that tamarind powder, tamarind powder and palm sugar mask incidental flavor and that hiking, which is neither a relaxed nor a strenuous physical state, is confusing. For thousands of hours we drift. We span light years, but how long and how far are less pressing questions than why? We know the answer. It is, a, it is as obvious to us as breath and fills us the same way. But it is measurable only in simile. We fought like braves. We made love like strangers. And so it demands we reimagine distance and time with wild, limitless depth. We sink willingly and too fast. We are pressed until we break and customize like warm forged steel that seeps through its contour and is left to cool as polytopes when blacksmiths are busy kissing. We pray we will be left blunted, not sleek, and that this will slow us when we fall because we will fall or gravitate back towards or re-enter, which are all the same thing, and only mistaken to be dissimilar by catalogers who lie and by the drag coefficient, which is a lie. Let there be no mistake. No matter how fast, we will plummet. No matter how hot, we will burn. No matter how hard, we will crash. And the finite world we once swore could never be swallowed whole will leave us wanting. Thank you. All right, another round of applause for Chris. All right, All right next uh, we have John Fogno. Um, I've been knowing John. I met John when he was in English 110, right? Comp lit. Yep. And it was very clear that he didn't really need to be there. He just <laughs> <laughs> so we did some other stuff. <laughs> and, you know, um, turned turn out um, great writer. Um, he's on his journey as well. Um, he just recently graduated um, UNH, and now he's just graduated in January from Fairfield with an MFA in fiction. Yeah, so um, definitely congratulations on that. And um, John, come up and read for us. So a little bit of uh, setup. This is from. Uh, a novel that I'm in the process of writing. Uh, it's called Ivory Skyline. It is a dystopia, future dystopia. The year is 2037. Um, a, uh, the, ba the basic background is your net worth is now categorized from 1 to 12. And it appears as a number on the back of your hand. Uh, my main character, Tom, uh, was expecting to get promoted from three to two, and instead was mistakenly made a 12, and was arrested for unlawful entry into Manhattan. And uh, this takes place, uh, the, the section I'm going to read takes place after he's been taken into custody and roughed up a little bit by the police. 
Tom woke up sitting in a chair, a quick jolt of pain in his neck fading as he opened his eyes. A man in blue hospital scrub stepped away from him, putting the air hypo back into the leather case. He blinked slowly. His head was pounding. He could taste something coppery in his mouth. He tried to sit up and found his wrists were strapped to the arms of the chair. Mr. Everly? A dark-haired woman in a gray suit was seated across the table from him. She had a tablet in front of her, and he could see his name upside down at the top of whatever document she had opened. He swallowed and nodded, trying to force saliva into his dry mouth. My name is Miss Ayala. I'm with Social Placement Services. I'm sorry for the restraints, but the processing officer said you were a violence risk. Tom sighed. Injection? The word came out barely a whisper, his parched throat having trouble forming words. Just a mild stimulant. We wanted to make sure you were fully awake and alert. The police said they had to use force to subdue you. He couldn't help but smirk. Yeah, I, I made them. She shook her head with a sigh. I'm sorry, Mr. Everly. Do you want to file an official complaint? I can do that for you. He shook his head. He knew it was pointless at this stage. Once Wells was on the case, he would subpoena all the security footage and make sure those bastards got their just desserts. All right, I just wanted to make sure you were aware that the option was open to you. Now, as I said, I'm with SPS, and your case has been assigned to me. You're a new 12, so we have to make sure you're given everything you're entitled to. By the time we're done, you'll have your housing placement, a new job, your food assistance benefit, and a mass transit budget. All of them will be key to your ID, so please don't sell, trade, or otherwise try and transfer your balance to someone. Tom furrowed his brow. Miss Ayala, listen, this is a mistake. I understand. Looking at your file, it says you were a three two days ago. Did you make a bad investment somewhere? Something that causes extreme of a drop? He shook his head. No, I'm still worth millions, or should be. Unfortunately, that's not my department, Mr. Everly. I will file an official inquiry with tax and wealth assessment, though. If this is just an error, we should be able to resolve it within 15 to 20 business days. What? Tom pulled against his restraints, trying to get out of the chair. 15 to 20 days? What am I supposed to do until then? Please calm down, Mr. Everly. I'm authorized to have you sedated again if I feel threatened. Tom slumped in his chair. She waited 10 seconds, making sure he wouldn't stand up again, and then continued. Until the situation is resolved, I would recommend keeping yourself out of trouble. Go to your assigned housing, attend your assigned job, and don't do anything foolish. If you're caught on another unauthorized access charge, you'll have to serve 10 days in jail and felony trespass will be added to your record. Then, even if the situation is resolved and your status reinstated, your status as a felon may impact your employment, your residency, and your access parameters. I should also explain that any attempt to tamper with, alter, or otherwise modify your identity card is also a felony, punishable by up to a $500,000 fine and possibly three years in prison. Do you understand what I've just explained? Tom nodded, closing his eyes. Good. Now it shows you that you have technical experience. You're good with data analysis? He nodded again. I work in an investment firm. Okay, one possible job assignment is in the Seagate extraction plant. You'll be analyzing power output and mineral yields. Does that sound like something you could do? Sure, sounds grand. His tone was bitter and sarcastic, but she didn't give any indication that she noticed. Then I'll get you a housing assignment in Bensonhurst. You can walk to and from work, save your transit passes for leisure time. She tapped away at the tablet as she spoke, typing in numbers and filling out virtual forms. Every so often, Tom could feel the implant in his left hand vibrate as data was transferred back and forth. We'll have all the relevant information ready for you once you're processed. You'll be issued a Palm computer, which will have everything you need on it. The Palm, though, is the property of the state of New York until such a time you've paid the purchase price, which will be automatically deducted in weekly increments from your paycheck. He smirked. Can't I just write you a check? She rolled her eyes. I'm sure you're aware that your access to assets that you may or may not have is restricted until your status can be resolved. Again, that's the Tax and Wealth Assessments Department's jurisdiction. He nodded with a sigh. Right. Can I call my accountant, my lawyer? I'm sorry, Mr. Everly, but no personal calls are allowed from processing. Since no criminal charges have been filed against you, you're not entitled to an attorney until you've been processed. But it's the processing I'm trying to avoid. She stopped typing for a moment and looked up at him. I don't think you understand the full gravity of the situation. There is nothing you can do right now that will have any positive effect on your future except to cooperate. You've already been status changed. You're a 12. While that may be an error, that's not something I can change from this office. Failure to cooperate with processing is a misdemeanor offense that can result in up to $5,000 in fines or 30 days in jail. No matter what may happen to you, once we're done here, it's better than going to jail. Wouldn't you agree? Her tone was icy. She was done trying to play Tom's game. Somewhere along the line, Tom had shifted from just another file to a potential problem in her eyes. He could only nod. He'd never been to jail, but had heard enough horror stories to know he didn't want to. Good. Her expression changed to a professionally pleasant smile once again. 
Let's get the rest of your forms filled out then, shall we? They spent the next hour working over all the digital forms. She had restraints on his wrist removed so he could sign his name. She knew he wouldn't be a further threat. Not anymore. As his last signature was placed, she smiled up at him. We're all set, Mr. Everly. We'll get everything ready for you. An assistant came into the room carrying a gray nylon messenger bag, the seal of the state of New York decorating the lower right corner, and placed it on the table. Miss Ayala opened up the plastic clips and pulled the contents out for Tom to examine. A blue plastic card marked with a citizen ID number, a pocket computer that looked like something from 2010 with a more modern chip reader jury rigged to the side of it, and a small plastic stick with a USB plug on the end. Miss Ayala held the blue card. This is your temporary ID. It's programmed to your citizen number and is connected to your transportation budget and food allowance, and has been keyed to access both your new living arrangements and the employee access door at your workplace. <coughs> he held up his left hand. Can I just use my ID chip for all of that? You can, but not every bus, subway, or corner store is a working chip reader. Carry the card on you at all times, just to be safe. What about my old accounts? My condo, my office. I'm sure you're aware, Mr. Everly, that Manhattan is a, is a nine plus restricted area. While your ID may still be connected to those locations trying to cross into Manhattan as a, as a 12 will result in another authorized, unauthorized access charge. I thought I'd made myself clear on this point. Tom sighed and nodded. It seemed impossible to him that everything he had known, every part of his old life, was completely unreachable. Right. Right. Yeah. She picked up the pocket computer. This is yours. The reader on the side is tuned to your chip, so no one else can access it. It has a new email address as well as applications for reviewing your budget and allowances and your work schedule. I have apps for that in my chip, he said with a sigh. She raised her eyebrows in slight surprise. All those applications are premium, Mr. Everly, and I'm sure they had all been deactivated once your status change went through. He furrowed his brow and tapped his thumb against the table, trying to call up his pocket secretary. Rita? Silence. Miss Ayala said, there is no access to the network from the processing center. Perhaps you'll have better luck once you're on the shuttle. Tom felt like ice was pumping through his veins. Rita, the persona of his virtual assistant, had been available to him 24-7 for the last 12 years. This was the first time he had called for her and didn't get an answer. He felt completely alone. The USB device, Ms. Ayala continued, is a cellular connection. It will give you a phone signal to use in conjunction with your implant. Tom nodded, but he wasn't really listening anymore. A hollow feeling had opened in his chest and was now spreading through him. He could feel his heart pounding against the inside of his ribcage, each pulse echoing in the emptiness of his sphere. His mouth was dry and his ears were ringing. He clenched his jaw, his mind a miasma of terror and rage. He could taste bile and adrenaline in the back of his mouth. She put all the items back into the bag and clipped it shut. We're all set, Mr. Everly. We'll escort you down to the reception area so you can wait for the shuttle. She glanced at her left hand and the green ape that was displayed there and the tiny time dates read out just above her wrist. It's almost 2.30 and the first transfer over the bridge leaves at 9, so try and get some sleep. For a moment, she looked like she would place her hand on his, but she stopped a few inches shy of making contact. Instead, she stood up and walked out, leaving him alone in the plane office, staring at the tone paint on the cinder block walls. He had the idea to dart out the door, to run like a wild animal down the halls and back into the Manhattan night, back to his mid midtown condo where he could forget all this ever happened. His nerves jangled with, with anticipatory energy, like a runner waiting for the starting gun, his hand shaking against the tabletop. The fantasy dissipated as two blue cat offers came to escort him down the hall. They didn't cuff him, but he held his arms firmly as they marched, pulling him along at their pace. His feet dragged, and the two just kept moving, keeping him from falling, planting him back on his feet with each misstep. They led him through the twisting maze of corridors to an elevator, where one of them pressed the down arrow. Thank you. Randall just stepped outside, so let's a uh, round of applause, I believe. John? Yes, you? thank you. Yes, John. Um, such a good job from all of you now, and I have to take you from that magical world and destroy you with the inside of my mind. <laughs> I'm a physics professor, for those of you that don't know Matthew Griffiths, some of you are suffering under me, and have suffered under me before. Uh, I'm interested in poetry and I write poetry because when I look at physics I'm trying to find out what earth is underneath it, how do we hold this stuff together. So these are sort of my attempts to look into the abstract, or some of them are my attempts to look into the abstraction of how we know anything. Okay. This is called Hoist the function Functionaries on the Hawser of Prophecy. 
Thus, we trust our concepts tied with twist and bundled, fashioned rope of our good augurs and omens observed, taken in, in mind, such ideas of fibers, hairs, and fluff, cotton first, seen in knots and tangles, in myths and ghosts and stuff. We know now how to card hard and comb, drawing fine lines, distinctions, cobwebs in our heads, separating the short and shoddy, teasing true those long and strong, grappling at the astonishing speed, sinuous invention, ligaments of mind, and magic labored tests from earth to earth, trust to trust, gut chords singing good old yarns together, our much rehearsed songs, all part of theater, long, strong, and common. We build in little insights, aligned, tweaked, straight, integrated, argument, tightened, clinched, and pulled, fine idyllic filaments holding only in the whole. The family familiar in tractions, diction, friction, by tradition, in discipline, in strands taut and tight and right, drawing ropes of quality, we shave off the lazy nap, cut back the loopy hockles, outrageous spun redundancy, we nip and pluck off the fluff, singing to the Christmas bill, Occam all ye faithful. That's a joke. We snip and off extraneous, our rope is theory played out on stage for contemplation, made right as pulled, tested, strained, reduced, discussed, dissected, shown and shaved again, paradigms form into physicists' pageants and plays. Exemplars abound, wound around, around, capstans, spun and tales narrated by novices, practiced by priests, praised in demonstration, acclaimed in the lab, laid out in theory, in nexus explained. But all entwined and all enshrined, textbooks seen by audiences and choruses, observed from this side and that, theater of absurd, made simple, reliable, dependable, from this and that, we hang from song and yarn, from chord and strong, sinuous and old, twisted, tied, spun, and in our language, true. Strands abound, all safe and sure, made stronger and more secure, in the testing and retesting, in reading and rehearsal, in plays and stories, theories and audience, player and chorus, we are selling only what we are telling. A play in a play with truth augurs well to start with, but now the rope is laid, generation to generation, passed in explanation, grounded in emotion, our freedom is from care, we are talked into it, indoctrinated. Persuaded, so our doubts removed, it is now the major theater explaining all. Science, international and too late to stop. Strength is shown to us in satisfaction. Our play played out as one enshrined, a long rope or cable, a ply laid out, a plate of speculation entwined. As scientists we offer this spectacle of free entry theory performed, our skyhook hung on whimsy, prophecy, a fantasy for all. But it is our multi-story hawser that seems true. It is this which lifts our kind, engineers, technicians, and makers above the mud to build skyscrapers in the city, depending on the basics, a whole theory of wisps, a playwright's rope, so we believe brings calmness, reliability, relief to a ceiling of prophecies and an audience of hope. Our stories bring useful meaning. In our theater we trust, but our belief, our belief, ultimately forms in love. Okay, so that's where, that's how twisted a physicist can get when they try and ask what that subject is. Following along a little bit on the same thought, I'm going a little bit deeper, so that was about what a theory is, how our ideas hang together. Uh, this is looking at the foundation of words and numbers. It's called Words and Numbers, Safe Volumes 
and the finality of num and dum after the t in point. Robert Frost had boulders and stones. The chat is a bird that sounds like a granite bat. Chat, chat, chat. I have a point to make and the volume to add. The point is a verb that sounds like this. Oink. Oink. We point to, we point to a distant point. With the final oo, we point towards. To ward. Now to ward is to guard, to fend away. So when we point to ward, we make a defensed space, a garden, as long as it, is, as it is to get from here to there. In the word, we make a sacred, make it space, wide, tall, deep, as long as it takes from here to there, as wide as it takes to make it safe. My toward is your guarantee of space. I point towards and bestow on you a mental space. But backwards is my safe space, my past. Forward is my safe space, my future. Toward, we share together, gathering strength in a common action. Speaking of sharing, frost stones share a path. They make a wall, a well stream of words in woods, a bond between bounders, Boulders, each solo stone, a bold solo act, stones holding space. Each sequence a sentence, a poem stream, a telltaling of some mystic mental scent. Sentence expressed mystery, history of whim, smoke shown and shared. To simply speak is to lodge in space some independent, fledged words. Lift and lift. Give the little bounders, place each to fit in space and time. A common sentence is a wall to ward our mental space. Each good wall of words, much more than mere chatter, each good wall our neighbors share. Each word is a ward. And what is private and sacred to me becomes private and sacred to you. And after we point, a silence falls. Listen to that final t. For following in that spaceless space, a dimensionless point, there is our firstborn number, doubly sacred and unprotected. No physical reality, no connotations, no entrances or exits, no ward, no encumbrance, simple, silent, dumb, and numb. And what an art there is in collecting them. That's about words and numbers, which we all rely on. Here's a very comic little ditty. How am I doing for time? Uh, um, maybe five, two, six, seven more minutes. I don't know how okay. many minutes. Okay. Um, then I, I've been up for a longer time. Okay, yeah, about okay, I'll, 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 okay, I'll give you at least, at least three points. Okay, I'll give you there two you more. <laughs> I, I have three more. There you go. It doesn't get better. Better. <laughs> but this one's quick. It follows the others, but it's a little more complicated. <laughs> Science is, art is. That's the title. Science is straight, shorn, and taut. Art is happy, hairy, and hockled. <laughs> a hockle for those that I should have I should have put that up in up front a hockle when you've got a rope and it gets twisted and pulled and there's a little bit that is now on the side and a little mm -hmm. hockle that's a hockle okay <laughs> that's why we come to college <laughs> <laughs> just so they didn't know <laughs> that's why you work for the Atomic Energy Authority on wire ropes <laughs> okay um, this one, um, so sports analogy, but it's coming from the physicist side. It was a morning of resentment for me. It's called On Higgs, the God Particle in Public Radio. 
It seems at the appointed hour, the athlete was angry that team had lost a two-point lead, led them to relax. While research, it seems, has shown American adults, like American children, no less than the rest. In that way, the gravity is agglomerating and the space is vacuous. She was annoyed in the locker room after the game. They said, next time, she said it could have been over by now. The researchers asked a lot of questions. Somewhere the theory of mass was taking place, ideas forming. She alone chased down the opponent out of bounds, only her with hassle and aggression. She, right, righteous, furious, famous. Great swathes of adults with poor reasoning skills sit still relieving themselves in moments of sporting glory. Ignorant of the symmetry breaking in Stockholm through which Peter Higgs, the Higlet, would emerge out of bounds. The Higgs and the Higgs boson, that's what that's about. When, the, when he was, when it was being announced that he was getting the Nobel Prize and or, um, I can't remember whether it was the finding of the particle, one or the other, mm -hmm. um, American public radio was going on about some sports event, and I'm like, they just discovered the God particle. <laughs> so I was, I was like, no, get the priorities <laughs> the other way around, would you? Okay, um, this one uh, probably shouldn't go too public. Um, it's, uh, it's called A Bristol Bummer, or Mummy's Family Side. There was the suicidal potato merchant. His dad set up her dad on the old Gloucester Road, and brother Len, the other day, he found the body. Mummy, why do you not care about family history? We're the modern son. Well, war one and all. Move on. Her mother, I recall, died a death. Coal, purple, nicotine fine ash filter and tingling fingers, perfect for the pastry. Bulbs and flowers, she didn't like to eat, faded away, and the bombs fell, and the blenheims flew, incendiary in the very house, phosphorus, burned image on the teenage brain, cast shadows of basement balustrades, blast and flash, blinded both eyes out of the man that did. And that stamp album, the one he hid, flogged all the good ones he did, he did, down the Bristol Christmas steps, I bet. But be quiet, suck it up. Stay mum about the potato merchant. Your brother isn't well. <coughs> Hell, your sister isn't spoken of. So I sigh so deeply that a swollen gut bursts a chorus, a gas oven and a Macintosh, a stray lyric indicated that Leonard found the body. I'm left without that part of my family history. Far away, I sigh a sigh of the other side. Thank you, Matthew. I apologize for I had to run out. Um, legendary Kathleen Cleaver was coming through and she wanted, I had to go say hey, so I apologize. You know who she is, like Black Panther whole movement thing. No, seriously, so when she said come, I had to come, so I'm sorry. But thank you so much and I apologize for that. Um, all right, and so the finale is you, Ms. <laughs> Catalina Gonzalez. Um, Kat is a former student of mine, I gotta tell the story. You can set up if you want to. Um, we were in our history of history of African Americans, right? Um, the class and for their one of their projects, I had them. They could do some new creative projects. I let a lot of new creative projects. So Catalina gave me a CD, right? She told me, "Oh, yeah, I sing a song, or whatever." Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so she gives me the CD, and I don't listen to it right away. Um, I ended up going out in Alabama for something. I'm down there in my, in my parents' house, like I said, and, and I remember putting in the CD. Well, let me see what she got. So I threw the CD in, and I was like, oh my God. So I had to call, I did that, and email her up and say, girl, what do you, where do you keep all this? 
So anyway, she blew my mind away and very talented. Um, she recently graduated. Um, album just got released, right? In December. There you go. Um, and so I wanted to bring her back one more time before she get away from us and don't know us no more, you know. <laughs> but I got her on Facebook. I don't mind it. I don't care. <laughs> so anyway, um, Cats want to give us two, two yeah. songs. Two songs is great. Um, and yeah, so we'll just let you get started. I want to make sure I set up the um, this because I want to. I'm doing. I'm doing something with this. Trust me. All right. Trust you. All right. I will not be doing any of the songs though that I wrote for that class because I did not prepare. No, I know. Oh, I, <laughs> no, I don't want that. Life's been a little crazy, so. But yeah, I'm going to try and kick the. I was also in all of other a couple of creative poetry classes too. Yeah, yeah. Me, so, do a little bit of an English. I did a graduate with an English minor. I ended up pulling that together. But um, I'll probably pick the most poetic, I guess, or <laughs> the songs. The ones that don't get played too often. So, this first one's called Kiss of Revenge. Kiss the slide your own habitat of lies. You bite and face the pure dirt. Vicious viper. Um, it's kind of set um, 
it's kind of like a love song, but it's kind of set, I'm putting it around like 1950s in a smoky cigar bar where all the guys are wearing suits, nice hats, a lot of smoke going on, and there's the lady with the swing or the big band up front with the slinky red dress, kind of pin up hair. That's kind of the image that I had, and I hope that you guys kind of see that when I sing the song, and if you don't, that's cool. <laughs> I had a girl said that um, at a show in Cleveland that she thought it reminded her of a book. I forgot the book, I have it written down somewhere, but she thought that the song reminded her of a character she read once. But this is for boy. <laughs>
give another round of applause for Catalina. You and they kind of